Okay, Galatians uh, chapter 6, 7, and 8 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. The man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for everything you do for us and just for being who you are, that you came from glory, that you are eternal, came from glory, put on the flesh of a human and suffered and died for us, Lord, so that we could have eternal life. We thank you for that, Lord. We ask you to guide and direct this word into our hearts and lives today in Jesus' name, amen. So today we're talking about expectations. I seek the Lord for a sermon and sometimes he gives me just, you know, a thought or a scripture, but he just gave me one word. He wants me to speak on expectations. Sometimes he doesn't give me anything. But anyway, so we're talking about expectations today. So what kind of things do we expect? I used to grow a garden when we were in we lived in Illinois, in Peoria, Illinois. And my only hobby out there, because there's no fly fishing to be done out there, and hunting wasn't very good, my only hobby was garden. I had a pretty large garden. I had three rows of sweet corn. I had to plant three because the squirrel got one of them, got a third of it. Smut got a third of it, if you know what that. You know, some places in the world, they eat that smut. It's a delicacy in some places. I wouldn't eat it, but it's, a, it's actually like a mushroom. Anyway, I got off track there. I had 18 tomato plants. I had peas, beans, summer squash, carrots, winter squash, lettuce, broccoli. You could have a salad in my house. I'm telling you, that was Brussels sprouts. I had lots of veggies back in the day. I don't do that anymore. But when I planted, I expect, we're talking about expectations. I expected to have a good harvest. In Peoria, they had a long growing season. And I did, I had a really good harvest, but we didn't have technology to put everything up. We didn't have a freezer. So I gave them most of it away. But the garden doesn't grow all by itself. You gotta start the seeds ahead of time, the tomato seeds, and, and you gotta water, and you gotta fertilize, and you gotta weed. A good garden needs tending. We're talking about expectations. When I started my seeds, I had expectation. I started my tomato seeds in little peat pots and I had them on a bench down in the room in the cellar where the, not far from where the furnace was. It was a warmth right there. And um, I used to bake bread a lot back in the same time period. Expectation, that was a hobby also. You mix the ingredients, you put some, you know, you, you knead the dough, let it rise, form it into loaves, bake it. Delicious bread, maybe. <laughs> Expectations don't always come to pass. One time I used water that was too hot, hot to start the yeast and I killed the yeast. And I didn't know the yeast was dead. I mean, there are ways you can tell. I've never done that again, because you can, there's a way you can tell. But I have 12 cups of flour. That was enough to make four loaves of bread, a large batch of dead dough. So what do you do with all that dead dough? Too much to throw away. So I rolled it out into, out into little rounds like this. And I didn't know it was gonna happen. I put them in the oven and they made pita bread. I didn't know what pita bread was back then, but they came, they came open in the middle, just like pita bread, except there was no flavoring and it was unleavened bread. I mean, I had a huge batch of pita bread. I didn't know what to do with it. We put butter and salt on it and ate it. You know, it was, it was good, but my expectation wasn't for pita bread. It was for loaves of bread. I used to have my own recipes. I had, a, I had a rye bread that had molasses and I had a, I had a, 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 a whole wheat bread that was 50% whole wheat and had honey and walnuts in it. 
I mean, I was a pretty good bread maker back in the day. Haven't done that in years. Expectations. When I was a child, I expected to be punished if I got caught doing something wrong. Mostly I didn't get caught. <laughs> I was pretty crafty at being sneaky and not getting caught. Expectations. The time I set the men's room on fire at the Elks Club in Dubois when I was a teenager, I expected to get caught. I thought when I well, I thought I'd hear sirens. I, I went through alleys and stuff to get home. I didn't get caught, but that was a close one. I've told you guys about that before. How that happened? <laughs> I think you probably don't remember about that. And the time I, you don't remember that. I don't want to take the time to tell it right now, but I have a sermon I preach called Fire Changes Everything. And that was part of the illustration. Another thing that happened was I set my bed on fire. <laughs> and I don't smoke. But I set my bed on fire and I never got caught. My mother never said, Woody, where is that comforter that, that used to be on your bed? She never asked me what became of that thing. <laughs> And there was a big black mark in the ceiling, which I got, I got that off of there. <laughs> I've done a lot of stupid things in my life, and I probably haven't done the last one yet. Expectations. When Esther said, if I die, I die, she didn't know what to expect. She went in to the king anyway. And her boldness saved her people from certain destruction if the king raised the scepter and she touched the end of it then it would be okay and she was allowed to go in there but no one to, was, was to approach the king and they would be killed if they did if they weren't invited but Esther saved her the Jewish nation that was in that was there in captivity and she said, if I die, I die. To Mordecai, when he pleaded with her to go and talk to the king. David went to battle against the most feared warrior of the Philistines. He talk about expectations today. He just went headlong into the battle. He expected victory. I read that one from 1 Samuel 17, 32 to 37. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Remember, the entire army was afraid of this giant, and David was a shepherd boy. And Saul replied, you're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. Saul had his doubts, but David had his expectations. We're talking about expectations today. And continuing 1 Samuel 17 with verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with a sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Talk about expectations. He's looking up at this giant guy with a sling in his hand. I can't imagine what he was going to do with the stick. He had a stick in his hand. Maybe it was a diversion, so Goliath would wouldn't know what he was going to do with a sling. And why five stones? What if he missed with the first one? What if the first one only wounded Goliath? He might need another one or two or three or four. I don't know why he picked out five stones, but he had expectations what the stones were gonna do. 
Next week, my grandsons, my sons plus a grandson and I are going on a week-long fly fishing trip to Cross Fork in Potter County. I made preparations. I tied enough flies for all of us. I was furious in my fly tying. I made hundreds of flies. I went shopping for food. We go fishing with expectation. So that means we want to catch a lot of fish. We don't keep them, we just release them. It doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't mean we're going to catch a lot of fish. It just means we want to. Expectation is not the same thing as faith. Maybe you'll get what you expect and maybe you won't. Expectation is like anticipation. Some things we anticipate never happen. God sometimes has a better idea. Amen. Paul anticipated ruining the church. He was determined to eradicate those pesky Christians. And they didn't call them Christians yet at this point. But he thought they were a bunch of weirdos. The world thinks that of us now today too. God had a better idea than the expectation that Paul had. On the road to Damascus, God changed Paul's life completely. And he became an apostle. Started churches all over Asia Minor. Wrote a large part of the New Testament. And he died for his faith. Expectations. God changed his expectation into an amazing blessing for mankind. When parents are anticipating the birth of a child, the mother is expecting expectation. You've heard of a tsunami. But she's a tsunami <laughs> at this point. She's expecting a blessed addition to the family. I remember very well the birth of our our first son, we have three. We were excited, we got a room ready. We put a crib in there, put one of those uh, changing tables in there. Expectation, when we brought, when I, when I went to the hospital to get her and the baby and bring them home, we went up the steps to our apartment that was the second floor and he needed a diaper change as soon as we got in the door. And I said, I'll do this, stand back. I rolled my sleeves up and I gave him his first diaper change. I really did. I used to help with the baths and as much as I could. But Hannah's expectation, she was praying silently with her lips moving. This was in Shiloh. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was in those days. And her rival wife was tormenting her because the wife had children and Hannah wasn't able to have any child, which was a social shame for a woman in those days. It was a big stigma back, back then. And the Bible says she was praying in anguish. Her lips were moving, but no sound. She was praying silent prayer. Her desire hadn't become expectation. It was only desire until Eli the priest said, may the Lord give you what you asked for. She would become pregnant and she would have a son as promised. And his name, uh, what's the matter, what was his name? Samuel, the little boy Samuel. When he was weaned about three years or so, she took him down to Shiloh and gave him to the service of the Lord. And she grew up, he grew up under the tutelage of Eli the priest. She expected to do that from the moment, well, even before, because when she promised the Lord, if, if I get pregnant and have a son, I will give him over to the service of the Lord. And she would only see him once a year. When she made new clothes, because he was growing, she made a new robe for him and took it down there. But Samuel became one of the most powerful 
of the judges. He became a prophet. He anointed two of the kings of Israel, Saul and David. And even kings were afraid of him when he came around. He had a powerful anointing on his life. Matthew chapter 6, 31 to 34 says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's a clue about what we should expect. I expect God to make me holy. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Without holiness, <clears throat> I know that I cannot see God, but he makes me holy. We can all share in that truth. I have expectations for this church. I came here expecting it to grow. We had 35 people. Five of them died and five of them moved away. <laughs> then we were down to 25. Another family moved. We hover at 20. We, we go to 18. We go to 22 or 23. But my vision was that we would have to add on to the building. Remember I saying that? That was my vision. I don't know why it hasn't happened. That was an expectation. If all the visitors that have come through here stayed, we would have quite a crowd. We had a lot of visitors. They come, they go. I expected the church to be more Pentecostal. I mean, in worship, emotional, demonstrative worship. That's what we were always used to. But we don't even stand. I know, we're old and tired, myself included. And after about 20 minutes, I have to sit down. My back starts hurting. But I stand for a while. I stand as much as I can. We were used to people coming down, coming forward during our worship time, just getting out of the seats and coming down forward. That's what they do in the church we came from. That's what they do. They walk up to each other and say, pray for this or pray for that. Doesn't even have to be a deacon. or They just walk up, how about praying for me? And they do, they go around, pray for each other. And I was used to that, and I tried to get that going here. I pleaded with people to get out of their seats and come down around here during worship time. One lady threatened to leave the church because we were becoming too Pentecostal. <laughs> it's a Pentecostal church, that's what we're supposed to do. Another left because we weren't Pentecostal enough. Figure all that out. Well, I'm not trying to please people. I'm not. So what are God's expectations? That's what's really important, what God expects. He expects people to submit to him. That's point number one. Jesus came to this vile earth, lived a perfect life, allowed himself to be tormented, tortured, and died on the cruel cross of Calvary, not because he didn't have anything better to do. He did it because of his love for us. It's inexplicable, the love of God. Romans 5, 6 to 8 says, You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I can remember being ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us while we're still in sin. 
sub-point A. He expects unbelievers to come to repentance. John 1, 12 and 13, Yet to all who did receive him, even to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or husband's will, but born of God. That's an expectation that God has for sinners. Unbelievers, and we all were at one time, all have opportunity to embrace Christ as Lord. Everyone can receive God's love. Titus chapter two and verse 11 says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Those who reject him are without excuse. They just refuse to believe. Subpoint B. He expects believers to seek his counsel in all things. John 14, 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. See, the Holy Spirit was sent to guide us, to teach us, to counsel us. When we read the scriptures, the Holy Spirit brings an understanding. He brings a quickening. You read that and, and something jumps out at you that you never noticed before. You read the Bible over and over again, all of a sudden, wow, that scripture jumps out. I never noticed that before. That's the anointing power of the Holy Spirit on that word because that, the power of that word is something that, that you or someone that you will encounter will be blessed through you because the Holy Spirit has empowered you through the word. Seek the counsel of God always. You may be surprised at what he wants you to do. You will be surprised at how he does things. You may be surprised at what he wants you to do, but you will be surprised at how he does things. Subpoint C, he expects believers to be holy. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy, because I am holy. We're not to conform to the ways of this evil world. We must be holy. We must be separate from the desires of the world. Look what happened to the United Methodist Church. They're embracing evil in an effort to be humanistic and God will judge God will judge there's a chart that I found with percentage this is from the Pew Research Center this is they they have certain denominations here let's see 16 of them and they are telling you the percentage of the people in these denominations between 07 and and the year in the year 2014 the percentage of change in people that, that are accepting homosexuality I'll just name a couple of them this is the American Baptist churches of the USA in 07 40 percent of them and in 14 54 percent of them think homosexuality is okay. The Anglican Church, 07, 63%, and 14, 67%. This is a shocker. Assemblies of God, which should be zero, zero, in 07, 16, that's where my credential is, 16% of Assembly of God people thought homosexuality was okay, was to be accepted. And in 14, 26%. I was shocked by that. Church of God in Christ, that's, a, that's the black Pentecostal denomination. In 07, 19%. In 14, 22%. Uh, 
I'll skip a couple of them here. This is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. In 07, 56%. In 14, 73%. Accepting homosexuality. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. In 07, 44%. In 14, 56%. I don't know if I should read any more of these. It's getting depressing. But anyway, that's a trend in this country and around the world. It's more so in the other parts of the world. Subpoint D He expects us to bring honor and glory to Him in everything that we do. Inclusion of sin and evil do not bring honor to God. Ephesians 5, 16 and, uh, 15 and 16, Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. The days are evil. And now the culture is becoming evil. DEI in the schools. I think that stands for debauchery, evil, and iniquity. The I actually stands for inclusion. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to include perversion in the things that I consider normal. None of this alphabet stuff brings honor and glory to God. We need to be careful how we live not allowing the world's evil, which they think is normal, but it's emerging as an evil to enter our minds and our actions. We need to be careful. Point number two, he, he expects us to bear fruit. John 15, one to five, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In the Bible, the word fruit is often used to describe a person's outward actions that result from the condition of the heart. Good fruit is produced by us, in us, that is, by the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is, here's what they are, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. These fruits are not lemons, oranges, and apples. I could look across here, there's a lemon, there's an orange, there's a tomato. No. And we're to, we're to have all these fruits coming forth from us Oh, these fruits are qualities of the life of a Christian believer. This is how we're to live in order to bring glory to our God. The fruits of the Spirit are the outward evidence of the changed heart and life that now lives in us. The changed heart. Those fruits are the evidence of the changed heart. Point number three, he expects us to love him. The world doesn't love God. Much of the world hates God. The world system rejects God completely. That E, that stands for, that actually stands for equity, that's Marxism, socialism, and socialism hates God, hates the nuclear family, hates the notion of private property, which the Bible supports. World leaders think that they know what's best. There's a great divide between God lovers and God haters. James 4, for you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means 
enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. There is a choice, the world or God. We start as part of the world. That means the world system of thought and behavior and belief. We start that way. We emerge from that and become Christians. We become God people. No longer loving this world. Now we love God. The world's going to be destroyed. God is going to destroy this world. And he's getting a new one ready. We stop loving the world when we get saved. In our new life, we start loving God. The world is opposed to God. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God loved us before we loved him. He loved us from the foundation of the world. He knew about us, like that song said, on the cross. He knew about each person, specifically, on the cross. He knew which ones would accept him and which ones didn't, but he still loved all of them. Talking about God's expectations. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The great expectation is that God expects us to love him. We have expectations in life. We all do. We expect things. That doesn't mean they're going to happen. We have expectations of God. How we want him to bless us. That doesn't mean it's going to happen because he gets a better idea. <laughs> Sometimes you're very surprised how he does it. But God has expectations of us. So I challenge you today to examine your expectations. See if your expectations align with God's expectations. See if your expectations in life align with God's expectations of you. You know, I, when, I'm, when I read a scripture and be, and be prepared with a scripture, then I expect that scripture to have some kind of a power in it for someone on that day or that week or, or whenever. And I just got a word. He said, just talk about expectations. He didn't even say that as a thing. He said, expectations. So that developed into this sermon. Expectations. What are your expectations? What are God's expectations of you? And do they coincide? <laughs> that's, that's the challenge for you today. That's the challenge. Would you stand? There's one thing I'd like to do before we leave. I don't know where Nancy is right now. Uh, she sent, did you ever get that picture? You never got it? She sent me a picture of herself and her granddaughter somewhere out in the west. They're out there flit, flitting around. But I would like to gather around down here and want to take a picture to send it to her. You can wave at her. Hi, Nancy. You know, would you do that? Come on, Dad.